Hi, my name is Peter Anders. I'm a professor at Edinburgh Napier University. This is my lecture series on the evolution of complex systems. This is lecture 13, Politics and Economics and Interactions. This is part one of lecture 13. So in this uh, lectures, uh, we will look at how politics and economics are interacting. And in particular, in this part, we will look at how uh, each of these systems provides or sets environmental selection pressures for the others, and how this leads to the change of rules in the other system. So first, let's uh, review briefly uh, what we said previously about the uh, political system and the economic system uh, in the context of these interactions. So what he said is that uh, the political system is organized according to the logic of power, where the power is the power to set the rules of communications, how communications uh, work, how uh, perceptions of society inter are interpreted, how actions of the society uh, are decided. So this is the power to distribute resources to regenerate and expand society, and the power to decide which options with, uh, that are available for regeneration and expansion, uh, which are the options that are chosen. Now, all political communications are those communications, those human communications, which align with the logic of power, uh, which align with the identity of the political system, where alignment means that the communication is can be interpreted in the context of the logic of power, whether power is increasing or decreasing, or whether that communication has an impact on the extent of the power that the uh, the, uh, that the communications uh, lead to. Now, uh, in the political system, we said that we have sets of constraints, uh, which are coherent constraints and defined subsystems, and these are the institutions in the political system. So these are constraints that, cons uh, that are consistent in the sense that they don't produce a contradictory uh, impact on the communications. And by constraining the communications, by providing a reference to these constraints, they add further uh, meaning to these communications. So for example, you may consider the political parties, the parliament, or the electoral system, the elections themselves, as political institutions. So for example, in the case of the elections, there is a very uh, narrowly defined communication where uh, people put an X or a tick mark next to a name, and that's how they express their electoral preference. However, this happens in a very constrained, very well-defined uh, political communication context, where that simple communication is interpreted and impacts on the selection of the parties, uh, which uh, delegate their representatives to the uh, parliament and ultimately influence how the political power is distributed uh, within the country. So, as you see, the political communications are such that everybody participates, at least by participating in the elections, and even if they don't participate in the election, the fact that they do not attend, that, has a, a, that is, constitutes a communication in the context of elections. And what we also see is that there are professional political communications uh, which follow the professional language of the political system, and these are produced by the professional politicians uh, who generate most of the political communications. These are the uh, members of the parliament, possibly local councillors, uh, other uh, members of the parties or uh, people working for the parties through various government and other bodies who generate political communications, whose uh, communications align strictly with the professional political language uh, within the political system. Now here to note is that this professional political language depends on the country as well and depends on the political system as well. So in different political systems there are different professional political languages. So for example in a dictatorship 
should there is one kind of political professional language, while in a democratic system with multi-party elections, there is a different kind of professional political language. Now, moving on to the, econo uh, the economic side, <coughs> uh, what we see is that human communications produce uh, products which are, you know, quasi-permanent changes in the environment. So, for example, if you look at or a bowl, or a book, or a plate, or a table. These are changes in the environment uh, which are uh, which are maintained for some uh, period of time. That's until the plate breaks, uh, and these represent uh, human communications, which lead to the creation of these uh, products. And so in this sense, they serve as memories of these human communications, but they also serve as memories for the human communications that relate to them, which are the affordances, the, the ways of use of these uh, products, which uh, ways of use facilitate the reproduction of other human communications. And in the same way, services are also temporary changes in the environment, uh, which are uh, less persistent, perhaps, uh, than in the case of uh, our products, although they might have more persistent impact uh, in some sense. Um, so again, these are memories of human communications which lead to the production of these services. And again, they also facilitate further human communication. So for example, if you consider addressing, or class tailoring, or uh, dentistry, or teaching, or uh, being a chauffeur or a taxi driver. So these are all services which have an impact on the environment and serve as memories of the human communications which led to the production of these services and also facilitate a range of other human communications. Now, these products and services are exchanged in the context of the economy, and really the exchange of products and services for other products and services, these constitute their economic uh, communications. And the economy is the system of such human communications, which are about object and service memories and exchange of these. Yeah, there are special communication rules, which uh, set how many or how much of these services and products can be exchanged uh, for each other. And in particular, there is one kind of product, which is the money, which is a universal exchange product. So anything in the economy can be exchanged for money, and money can be exchanged for any products and services in the economy. Now, having this kind of universal exchange product simplifies uh, the way how the economy works, and as we discussed in the advanced uh, concepts, having this simplification expands the economy, makes it easier to produce uh, economic communications, because it reduces the chance of making errors in the estimate of exchanges. So having this universal exchange product, which is a very standardized exchange product, uh, where you can know uh, very well what is the birth of one uh, service or one product in terms of this special product money, it facilitates uh, the uh, the error-free exchanges, and as a, result, as a result, leads to the expansion of the economy uh, where the money is used or introduced uh, in the economies. Now, the banks are particular organizations in the economy which regulate the amount of money, so they create or absorb money depending on how they manage uh, the money, for example, how much interest uh, they charge on the money, how much interest they pay on the money. Uh, say, for example, uh, if uh, they pay interest and if they lend the money that they have to others who pay interest on the, that money when as they repaid, the banks create more money in the economy. On the other side, when they charge fees for keeping the money in the bank and they don't lend it out, effectively absorb the money. So, in effect, uh, how the uh, banks work. Uh, effectively models how the economy works, how the money exchanges work in the economy. The banks register all these money exchanges, so they are the managers uh, of, the, uh, of the memories of uh, 
of economic communication, so they have information subsystem within the economy, and as well as a result, they generate the model of the economy and how the banking system works. That describes how the economy works. Now, of course, um, banks. Uh, in terms of functionality of them have been around for a while. Uh, a key uh, change in how the money works was in production of paper money, uh, which has a value by convention, and further later the electronic money, uh, which is again its value by convention. And uh, in the case of the electronic money, there is actually no uh, physical representation, uh, no actual product which represents uh, that money, but all that is stored through communications uh, in computers, uh, which maintain uh, the, the records uh, about the available amounts of money on, on accounts. So having uh, money by convention uh, and further by electronic storage of the information that further simplifies uh, the, uh, how the economy works and aids the expansion of the economy. Now, so we looked at uh, aspects of the economy and aspects of the political system. How do they uh, interact? And how do they interact? in the context of our systems theory analysis. Now, in the political system, the way how the political system operates leads to the distribution of power in the society and the determination of which opinions, in uh, political opinions, have more influence on power. Of course, this is represented by uh, parties which get elected and the composition of parliaments and local governments which uh, drive how power is distributed. Now, um, the, the power sets the rules about communications. How the society communicates within it about the distribution of the resources. Now, among other things, these rules also apply to economic organizations. So, for example, if, if in a country the political uh, leaders, those who are in power, decide that they wish to nationalize, let's say, the railways, that change is very fundamentally how railway uh, organizations operate. Or in the same way, if they decide to privatize uh, the previously state run railways, that again changes quite fundamentally how the organization in this particular sector works. But there are many other aspects where the political system impacts on the, uh, on the rules affecting the economic organizations, so, uh, starting from setting uh, the, the levels of various taxes, um, to the uh, setting of ways of how accounting reporting should work, um, how uh, possibly investments uh, are regulated, and so on. Now, let's uh, take one particular example. Uh, in, the, uh, in the US, the Bell System Company, which was uh, founded in 1875, effectively became a uh, a practical monopoly in the air, uh, in the domain of telephony. So Bell was providing as a huge organization telephony services across uh, the whole United States. Now, of course, that meant that they were in a, a monopolistic uh, position where they could set uh, the fees for their services. There was uh, really practically no, uh, nobody else to compete with them. And they could uh, run their business potentially uh, not very efficiently because there was no competition from them. So uh, what happens, uh, is, or what happened is that um, the, the social discourse about not monopolies uh, changed, and if you like the power talk, the discussion that 
in society that determines how power might shift and how power gets distributed among the political parties and the political players, shifted such that the anti-monopoly agenda uh, became a key topic. Um, the, uh, the parties and members of the Congress and Senate uh, felt that in order to keep their support, they need to align with the anti-monopoly agenda. And what that meant is that um, the majority of the political decision makers were supporting an anti-monopolist uh, agenda and the translation of this anti-monopoly agenda into an anti-monopoly legislation. So this was a legislation that was aiming to stop uh, the monopolist behavior uh, in the telephony services by now. So this is, uh, happened in 1984 in the US when the regional bell companies were created effectively. The single monopolist company was divided into parts, uh, regional parts, and the uh, local and long distance uh, phone markets were opened up. So when a number of companies could offer and uh, the bells, uh, the bell companies were uh, obliged to um, offer their infrastructure to service these other companies at, uh, at a regulated cost. Uh, such that other companies could offer uh, potentially better services uh, to their clients. So, there was a new political environment, which was represented by the anti-monopoly legislation, and the support for this anti-monopoly legislation among uh, the politicians and among the electorate who were voting for these political uh, representatives. Now, this, this new legislation created new environmental pressures in the economy, and in particular in the part of telephone services. Uh, so this new kind of competition changed how the uh, economic organizations, the companies in the telephone services uh, operated. So there were several new companies emerging, in particular in the long distance market. And because they were uh, ready to operate more efficiently than the original Bell company, they were able to capture a significant share of this market. So these were companies like Sprint, the MCI, and the WorldCom uh, at that time. So uh, what we see there in this particular example is that the, uh, the discussion in society, the, the discourse about political power, in particular in this area of anti monopoly legislation, is changing. The anti monopoly legislation is gaining popularity. So the politicians uh, talk more about it, they align themselves with it in order to get elected, and when they get elected, they change the legislation which impacts on the economy, breaks up the bell creates uh, more open markets, and creates more competition and better service. Now, of course, this works on the other way as well. So in general, the economy is growing. And if the economy growth is there, then uh, there are many benefits for everybody in general. So essentially, uh, the growth of the economy requires more money. and uh, generates more money, generates more goods and more services, and overall provides a better life for everybody. On the other side, if there is economic stagnation or economic shrinking, that effectively shrinks the available amount of the money in the economy. That leads to fewer products and services, and overall, reduces the quality of life and makes life less enjoyable uh, for people. So clearly, people prefer growth rather than stagnation and shrinking. Of course, uh, at the same time, how to drive the economy in, in the way of uh, growing is not always simple. There are a number of factors that matter. 
and order to the uh, our economists and uh, politicians know better than before, there are still huge swings in how the economy works. Think, for example, about the 2008 um, uh, crash of the markets um, and a number of others, the 2001 uh, dot-com bubble uh, bursting and so on. So clearly, at the world scale and, uh, of course, at the scale of each individual uh, economy in each country, there are events that are unpredictable and lead to either unexpected growth or unexpected shrinking in the economy. So, if you are, uh, if you see this, uh, how the economy works, then of course at uh, election time, the parties aim to uh, become popular, get popular support, and in order to that, they formulate economic policy. You say, what will they do with the economy in order to win the popular support for their representatives so they get elected and they get majority, let's say, in the parliament? <coughs> now, if, uh, if the economy is growing, then generally the government and the party that uh, supports the government praises itself. So it says that uh, they are doing a good job. That's, how, that's why and how the economy is working so well. Of course, the opposition usually tries to find some alternative critic. So they say, yeah, sure, the economy works well, but there are other issues. Uh, for example, the environment is not protected well enough. There are moral issues and so on. So on both sides, uh, there are arguments. And uh, if you have multi-party systems with more than two parties, each party tries to position themselves in a way that um, tries to get credibility and support from the people. Now, in the other case, when the economy is shrinking or there is stagnation, the government and the party behind or parties behind the government typically come up with a new vision, they offer new promises, they say that yeah, the growth is just after the corner. On the other side, the opposition typically argues that everything is wrong because of the government. And if you can, if you have multiple parties, each takes a position somewhere on this, uh, <clears throat> somewhere on this spectrum, uh, either arguing uh, that things are fine, just a little bit more uh, tuning is needed, or saying that things are definitely not fine. Now, clearly, in this way, the economy impacts how the political system works, because what the individuals, humans, perceive through their economic context, either that their uh, life is getting better or that their life is not getting better at all, that impacts on what they think, how they see the uh, party who is supporting the government and how they, they see the parties who are against and outside of the government. So in this way, the economy sets the stage for the competition and sets the selection pressures. So they meeting or changing the current economic policies, uh, which option will lead to a better outcome in the short and possibly longer term. So these economic selection pressures contribute to the selection of the parties in the competition uh, in the context of the political system. So in this way, the economy impacts on the political system and on the uh, competition of the parties. So to summarize, uh, we looked at politics and economics. We uh, reconsidered some of the key concepts that are relevant from the political system and the economic system. And we considered the interpenetration interaction of these two systems in terms of the provide, provision of environmental selection pressures. We considered example in both ways when the politics changes the environmental pressures for the economic system, economic system and also when the economic system changes the, uh, the pressures uh, in the context of the political system. Let's see a few questions and answers. First, is it true that the money is a form of economic communications? Well, <clears throat> what we said is that the money is a universal agree, that can be exchanged for anything. And because this is the case that you 
in modern economy, you exchange everything for money. In effect, you can see uh, the, the, uh, the monitoring of the amounts of money that get exchanged and the amounts of money that uh, are kept uh, as economic communication. So effectively, for example, banks uh, store all economic communications in terms of registering the movement of money from accounts and the uh, registering the amounts of the movement between accounts. So in that sense, you can see money as a representation of the economic communications. Next, uh, is it true that the logic of economics is uh, the following? Is this communication leading to more or less money? And well, in a, in a sense, uh, I think that, that that is right. In a sense, all economic communications are about exchanging goods and services for money. Uh, in the abstract sense, they are about monitoring how money is, uh, how much money is stored in accounts and how much money is exchanged between accounts. And the economic communications are those which are relevant in this context, which are relevant from the perspective of exchanging and storing money, and which are relevant from the perspective of having more or less money as an ultimate result of these exchanges and economic communications. Finally, is it true that deflation is a form of economy acting on politics changing its rules? So, deflation is the, uh, the opposite of inflation when the, uh, the value of the money is rising. Effectively, um, this is when the economy is shrinking, when the volume of the uh, money uh, is changing, so relative to the, uh, the existing economy, less money uh, is available <coughs> in the economy, less is the monetary mass in the economy. So, when that happens, of course, uh, that, as we discussed earlier, that leads typically to shrinking of the economy. It leads to recession. And, of course, recession impacts on politics. It leads to a shrinking of the economy. And that impacts on how politicians talk, what political topics, uh, become important for uh, the individual humans. And in this way, indeed, deflation acts on the political system by changing the topics of discussion and effectively changing how political discourse, political communications are uh, generated and effectively changing the rules of the political system, although perhaps to a small extent, but it does change it. Thank you.